Aaron Patterson. Hello. <laughs> I love Madonna. All right, all right. Uh, oh my God, hello, happy Saturday. Uh, woo! Pew, pew, pew. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson, uh, also known as Tender Love. I'm Tender Love on Twitter, GitHub, etc. You can Google Tender Love, but the search results might not be safe for work, so be careful. Um, I work for at and Interactive, uh, and I have to say thanks to them because I am currently employed full-time to do open source work. So I work on open source all day. So uh, thank you. And because I work for at and that means I must be an enterprise developer, <laughs> which I am. You can go to this address, and you'll see that I am, in fact, an, enter an enterprise developer. Um, I'm a Ruby core committer, and not a Rails core committer, I'm just a Rails committer. There we go. So, uh, first I want to talk about my failures, and uh, the first failure is I am not a Rails core committer. And I, I wonder to myself why I work on Rails full time and I'm not one yet, and if you wonder the same thing, I encourage you to ask DHH. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> Huh? What? What? Sorry, okay. Continuing on with my failures. I am presenting last. Um, I like Ryan Davis. My, my slides suck. I'm sorry, Shane. Uh, I use Minitest. I enjoy reading RFC 2119 for fun. Uh, read this. You'll understand why I don't like RSpec. Um, I don't have method, parents on method definitions, so my code looks like this. Uh, most people here say that they use Ruby and JavaScript, but really, I code more C than I do JavaScript, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but really, I want to talk about my failures as a presenter. Uh, <laughs> so, I really like to have fun and, and give a talk. I want to have fun giving talks and entertain people, but at the same time, one of the reasons I really enjoy going to conferences is so that I can learn something practical. Um, <laughs> one of the best things about, about coming to conferences is learning something and being able to go home and use that, you know, use that new thing that I learned, and I, I love doing that, but the, the truth is, like, I, I'm a nerd, and I, I enjoy boring things. I really enjoy boring things, and one of my biggest failures as a presenter is I don't know how to combine the two. I can't, I, I don't yet know how to make uh, boring things interesting yet. So, uh, tonight I'm going to do two presentations. Uh, I'm going to give a practical presentation and I'm going to give a fun presentation. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope this fits under 30 minutes. <laughs> So, I, I like to eat dessert first, so we're going to start with the fun. Uh, how many of you were at Gogoruka last year? Okay, yeah, all right. I was not at Gogoruka last year. I probably should have listed that under the failures, but I was not. Uh, I heard last year that there was a presentation that was very popular, and I, I want my presentation to be popular too, so I decided to write a guide about, about making popular presentations. And um, Ryan was reviewing my slides and he told me that it wasn't, like, I didn't know much about the talk and he said it wasn't really popular so much as it was notable. So this is actually your guide to presentation notoriety. And as far as I can tell, three bullet points, sorry Shane, uh, you need a provocative title, risque photos, and possibly Ruby code. So uh, first step is we'll come up with a provocative title. Um, Use Ruby, use Ruby 1.9 like an engineer. Not, not provocative, sorry. So the way to fix this is we will fix it like this. Ruse, use Ruby 1.9 like a sexy engineer, right? Easy, no problem. So next up is um, risque photos. Everyone, this is, this is totally important. And so what I like to do is take a lot of photos and make sure that I have, you know, come up with these risque photos and 
Uh, one of my favorite TV shows is America's Next Top Model. So um, what I did at home for inspiration was I did America's Next Top Engineer. And if anybody here watches that show, you'll know that basically what happens is you have a guy at a camera shouting out a bunch of words, and then somebody in front of the camera trying to uh, act out what those words mean. So what I'm going to show you next is um, the words in combination with me acting out the, the words. So these, you know, just some ideas for you guys to come up with risque photos for your, your slides. So our first one is uh, confidence. Uh, we have elegant, sultry, sexy, thoughtful, fierce, thank you Tyra, playful, powerful, and finally provocative. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And finally, the, the last thing to having a notable presentation is obviously Ruby code. So I went online, I found some Ruby codes, and <laughs> too long, didn't read it, don't care. Don't need it. So that's it for my first presentation. We're going to go move on to the practical presentation now. So. Uh, <laughs> I have a really bad sense of humor. But <laughs> I should have put that under failings. The, the title of this talk is um, The Hidden Gems of Ruby 1.9, and uh, really this is, a, this is a Ruby 1.9 PSA. This talk is a public service announcement for Ruby 1.9. Please upgrade to Ruby 1.9. Ruby 1.9.2 is awesome. You should use it. Um, so ah, back to the terrible joke. The reason, that, the reason it's titled this is because I'm not going to talk about gems at all. Everything I'm going to talk about is from the standard library, so please run now. Anyway, the first thing I want to talk about is Minitest. <laughs> so this is, this is our, our normal testing, you know, normal test. It looks like our normal test unit stuff. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of the differences here between a mini test test and a normal test unit test. Unit test. And the, the first thing is uh, instead of requiring test unit, we require a uh, mini test auto run. Uh, next notable difference is we inherit from mini test unit test case rather than test unit test case. So a base test might look like this. Uh, next. Difference is we don't have assert nots in Minitest. We have refute underscore, so uh, this makes all of the asserts and refutes line up nicely. So a, an assert not would translate to something like this, refute equal food, food is not equal bar. Um, we have a new, a new method called skip, and what skip does is let us skip a test. So let's say we have some test that doesn't really work on, or it doesn't make sense to run on Windows, or is something that we're, we're not ready to implement yet. We can just use the skip method. And when we run our tests, we'll see output like this. So we can see, you see there's a new statistic down at the bottom, and, it's, uh, and we have assertions, failures, and then skips. Uh, next up is randomization. Um, Minitest randomizes the order in which your tests are executed. So you'll see this. You'll see that this test case modifies uh, global values when it's running, and sometimes it'll fail and sometimes it won't. We, the execution of one test affects the execution of the other, and that's a bad thing for our tests. We see sometimes we get, you know, all of our tests pass and everything is fine, but sometimes we get um, an error. And. You'll see at the bottom there's a new option here. It says these test run options dash dash seed. What that seed is, is the random number seed that was used to determine the order in which the test should run. So we can grab that command line option dash dash seed, also tack on a dash B for ver verbose, run the test like this, and then we'll be able to see what tests were run and in what order so that we can debug the problems in our test files. Uh, another interesting thing is test performance. If we use mini tests, we have a test like this, like let's say one of our tests is slow, obviously you would probably not write a test that sleeps, but let's say we have tests that are slow, uh, like this guy. 
when we run the test with dash verbose, we can actually see what the test times are. So you can see up there that test slow took 10 seconds. So if you have slow tests, you can figure out where those slow tests are. Uh, if you're running with rake, then you should use this test ops, the test ops environment variables. So you can tack on a dash v, and then you'll see it. Um, next up, oh man, 13 minutes. <laughs> it's already been 13 minutes. I'm not halfway done yet. Our spec. Um, yes. So did, does everybody know that Ruby 1.9 ships with RSpec? No? No? You did not? Look at this test. Looks like RSpec, doesn't it? Right? 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 Actually, it's not. That is Minitest spec. Um, Minitest has an RSpec-like notation. I encourage you to check it out. You just do require Minitest spec, require Minitest auto run, and then you too can write tests that look like our spec. Hmm? Okay, apparently you do not need that required. Thank you, Ryan. I made a mistake. All right, next up is object space. How many of you know about object space? Yes, everybody, I'm sure you've seen code that looks like this, object space. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I do that all the time, debugging stuff. I don't know what's in the virtual, virtual machine. <laughs> What's going on? All right. In, in, okay, I mentioned that I code C a lot, so there's gonna be C in these slides. I'm sorry, another failure. Um, in Ruby 1.9, we have Obj Space. These are extensions to Object Space, which can give us um, interesting statistics about the, uh, the current state of the virtual machine. Uh, there's four new methods. <sighs> sorry, Shane. <laughs> bullet points. There's four new methods. Uh, count object size, mem size of, count nodes, count key data objects. We're going to take a look at each of these. Count object size returns to us a hash that is um, the keys are the types of objects that currently exist, and the values are the total number of bytes that that particular object is taking in memory when you call this method. So you get a return value that looks like this. So we can see that, uh, for example, we have to some number, I can't count, I'm nervous, T class, there's some number of bytes. Um, so it's interesting, interesting for debugging, so we can figure out how much memory any particular object is taking up total. Uh, mem size of, mem size of will tell us how much memory a particular instance is taking, so we can give, we pass an instance of an object to mem size of, and mem size of will return the number of bytes that that, uh, that, that object is using. So this, this object returns 232, so it's using up 232 bytes of memory. But with mem size of, there's a caveat. Um, we have to implement our own uh, memory allocation, or we have to implement our own function to determine how much memory is being used. Uh, all right, sorry, C codes. Uh, there's a new pointer on RB data type struct. It is this D size pointer, where we give it a we give Ruby a function pointer that returns a size t size t value, and Ruby will call when you call mem size of Ruby will call that function and then use whatever the return value of that function is to give back the size value. So here is a a very stupid implementation where we just return 10 from my mem size. So whenever somebody inspects this particular object, it'll always return 10 and say that it's claim that it's taking 10 bytes of memory. Uh, the other caveat with this is that it's only implemented on uh, native objects. So things that are any type of Ruby object that's implemented in C. So uh, most normal Ruby objects will return zero because this, this function is meant to count uh, the amount of memory that the backing C struct is supposed to take. So, next up is count nodes, and this actually counts the number of parse nodes that Ruby found. So we'll see that it returns a hash with the nodes and the count, keys as nodes, values as count, and we can actually tickle this, tickle these particular stats by running code that looks like this, loop over, count, print out the number of if statements that Ruby has parsed, and we'll see that if we loop over this, 
will actually increase the number of, will see the number of if statements parsed increases. Count data objects. Um, this counts native objects, so anything that's implemented in C, we can get the keys. For some reason, this is inconsistent with the other methods, but the keys are actually classes rather than, rather than um, symbols, and the values are the number of times I found that. So this, on this particular run, we had 64 instances of instruction sequence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can also tickle this by allocating any type of C-backed uh, Ruby object. So this allocates a bunch of fiddle closure objects and then prints out the number of closures that have been, that are currently instantiated. So when we run this, we'll see the number increases. All right, object space is finished. Fiddle, does anyone know about this? Sweet, all right. Fiddle is a libffi wrapper that is in Ruby 1.9. Ruby 1.9.2 now depends on libffi. How many people have heard of Ruby FFI? Okay, excellent. Uh, the Ruby FFI also wraps libffi, so these are, two, these are two separate libraries, but Ruby is now dependent on libffi. So we can use libffi from uh, Ruby standard library. But uh, Fiddle only wraps um, function calls and closure allocations. libffi provides two uh, two utilities. One is to call native methods, and the other is to allocate native closures. And that is the only thing that Fiddle handles. Fiddle can call native functions, and Fiddle can allocate closure, allocate closures. But it can't do things that DL does. For example, open uh, shared libraries or do any type of memory management. So. Uh, I want to look at how DL and Fiddle interact, and we're going to do that by looking at calling functions using um, DL and Fiddle, and we have to do four, four steps to do that. Open a dynamic library, locate the function pointer, wrap the function pointer, and call the function. So this is, the, this is our end result, end result code. This line opens libm, so we're going, to wrap, we're going to wrap the sign function that's provided by libm. Uh, we have to open the dynamic library, then locate the function pointer. Here we're locating the sign function out of libm. Then we allocate a new fiddle function, and we have to provide the parameter types as well as the return values. So we tell fiddle about those, and then finally we can call the function and determine the, determine the value of um, pi over 180. So, creating closures. Let's say we want to create a function that looks like this, similar to sign. Returns a double, takes a double. It's very easy with fiddle. We just subclass fiddle closure. This is different from Ruby FFI. Ruby FFI asks for lambdas, if I remember correctly. But here, we subclass fiddle closure. We implement the call method. And then inside of call method, we return whatever value we want. Now, uh, we, allocate this, we allocate this function, or this um, object, and tell it the return value and the parameter values, just like we did with um, the functions previously, and then we can call it. But uh, the important thing here is that when we call function.call, we're not actually exercising libffi at all. When you call this call method, it's actually only exercising your Ruby code. So the contract is that you have to assume that libffi will call your call method. So this is powerful, and the reason I think it's powerful is that it lets you test your closures. So you can test your closures in pure Ruby without ever having to open up some particular um, C library and passing your closure to that C library. You can make sure that your closure does the right thing without ever having to hit native code. So, to use our, we can actually use our closure and eat our own dog food. Um, the, the function returned from our my sign instance responds to 2i, and 2i returns the memory location where that closure sits. So we can actually wrap that function with a fiddle function and then call it. So we're creating a function, wrapping the function, and then calling the function. Down here, the only change, the only change we have is down here where, where we allocate a new fiddle function, then we call it. Um, yes, I asked everyone 
Who is familiar with Ruby FF5? This is Ruby FF5 code. This will run with Ruby FF5's wrapping lib tidy, uh, which is a library for cleaning up your HTML code, and this will run with Ruby FF5 today. But we can implement this in terms of Fiddle. And the code to implement it in terms of Fiddle looks like this. Don't read it, I just want to show you. It's short. We can implement it in pure Ruby. So now this code, which was Ruby FFI code, is also Fiddle code. They are exactly the same. So, Psyche. Psyche. Psyche is a YAML parser. It is in Ruby 192 and up. It wraps the YAML, it replaces sick, and it is opt-in. In order to opt-in, you need to set the Psyche YAMLer. So normally when you do require YAML, YAML will use sick. You have to do something specific if you want it to use psych, or you can just do require psych. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of this talk. <laughs> so everyone knows how to dump and load YAML. It looks like this. We all know about this, uh, but I want to talk about new features. Um, JSON is a subset of YAML. In, it is a full subset of YAML in YAML 1.2, but not YAML 1.1. As far as I know, the only thing that uh, YAML doesn't support in YAML 1.1 is UTF-32, but I'm not sure. I really don't know. I can't find that information. So, uh, site will load and dump JSON. Ta-da. It's manager. Um, okay, I already gave you the JSON disclaimer. But the new stuff I want to talk about is event parsing. Uh, site supports Evented parsing for your YAML. And what I mean by this is rather than buffering up the YAML and then getting some data structure back, we can actually get uh, real time notifications of events when our YAML is parsing. If you're familiar with XML SAC style parsing, this will, be, this will be familiar. So we can write a handler that looks like this, and whenever we see a start sequence, an end sequence, or a scalar value, our object will get notified. And we, we use it like this, instantiate a new parser, pass in our handler, and then we can give the parse method an I.O. object. So when we run this code, we'll see output that looks like this. Fairly straightforward. But what I want to talk about is that we actually can give it an I.O. or a string object. And I think that this is a very powerful feature. We can provide YAML with a, uh, a socket, for example, or an open file handler and we'll get this evented, evented system going on. Uh, it also supports evented emitting. So the hard way is like this. We can create a new emitter and then just call methods on the emitter over and over and emit YAML. Uh, but this is hard, and I don't like it. The output looks like this. And uh, if you want to see all the, different, all the different events, read the R doc for this class. It's got everything you want to know. Um, but stream emitting is another, another thing that uh, Psyche supports, and I like to think of this as the easy way for evented, evented emitting. Um, what this does is it emits YAML documents, but it emits them immediately. There's no buffering. It serializes the, the um, Ruby data structures to YAML immediately for you. There's no buffering, and I believe that this interface is much easier than the previous one. So, oh, the important thing here too is that we're emitting multiple documents. So each call to push emits a YAML document. So here we emit two YAML documents, the output of it will look like this. But there is a problem. I don't know if any of you notice what that problem is. How many of you use streaming YAML for APIs? <laughs> Nobody. That's what I thought. But, as I mentioned earlier, JSON is a subset of YAML. So, we can stream JSON too. And all we have to do to stream JSON is change our code from this to this. Ooh, the only difference is this. And we get a streaming JSON parser for free, or emitter for free. So, what this is, is um, JSON that's delimited by three dashes and three dots. So, Uses, can anyone think of uses? Better yeah, better, better Jabber protocol. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> Twitter uses streaming, Twitter uses streaming, 
Virginia, JSON for its APIs, you can write something similar. Um, I was going to put a slide in here for more info, but I didn't, so you should Google for that. Uh, <laughs> and wow, I actually did it. I can't believe it. I am under 30 minutes, so I will take questions. <laughs> Um, I actually have more slides, so if there are no questions, I can do more. Who does your hair? <laughs> Ebby. Who are she you is wearing? sitting over here. What? Who are you wearing? Who am I wearing? Uh, that's uh, Dolce and Gamara. Okay. Come on. <laughs> yes. I have sort of a question, sort of a plea. Turn the um, mic on. To people who are Mike. 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 Just get closer to it. Rock the mic. Oh, no, apparently it's all false. I will repeat the question. I can hear you. Um, to people who make end products, go ahead and use site that's awesome. To meet people who make libraries, like the Twitter library or the, you know, whatever, please don't require site. It makes it impossible to use your library in a JRuby app or a Rubinius app or something that doesn't have this library. So, ah, oh, sweet because I completely disagree with you. Um, <laughs> the, the, the plea was don't use Psych because um, you can't use it on JRuby. Don't, if you're a library writer, do not use Psych because you can't use it on JRuby. Uh, that is true today, but will not be true in the future. One of the reasons, um, one of the things that was important to me important to me about wrapping libyaml is that it is something that everybody uses. Us Rubyists are not the only ones that use libyaml. It is also used by Python. I believe it was actually factored out of Python to be a standalone Ruby or a standalone C library. But um, the important thing is is that it is very well known in the community, and there is actually a Java implementation. So. Uh, I am working on this, but my C skills are much better than my Java skills. There will be a Java version for JRuby. So while it is true today, it will not be true tomorrow. More questions? More slides. Oh, hold on. I really like that. <laughs> Um, what else do I have? Hold on a minute. I need to see. I need to see what else I have in my in my thing. Uh, I guess coverage. Man, I look like I look really buff in this picture. <laughs> look at those guns. Dang. Um, coverage is another new another new thing in standard library. I blogged about this recently, but there are two methods. Very simple. Uh, start and result. Can't get can't get easier than that. Um, <laughs> Come on! So let's say we have a class that looks like this. You probably can't read it, but I will tell you what it does. Uh, it iterates over a line 10 times. There are some comments in there. There is also an if statement where part of that if statement does not get executed. That's all you need to know. Um, and I think I highlighted those parts. So these parts never get executed, the end blocks, the comments. Uh, this line is executed 10 times, this line is executed never, and when we run this file, some stuff happens. Not, you know, super amazing, this example code. But the way that we do coverage for this file is we actually have to require it. So the interface to coverage is kind of strange. We, ha we have to measure the coverage for the file like this. We start coverage with coverage.start, and then we require the file. Uh, doing require A, and then we print out the results. So this is where we actually execute our RB file. And the results will look like this. And it looks kind of weird, but what it is is a hash where the keys are the files that were required, and the value is the cover coverage information for that file. A nil means, a nil value means that the line will never be executed. A number means the number of times that that line was executed. And you will get zeros for lines that could have been executed but weren't. So with this information, we are able to learn the lines executed, the number of times a line was executed, and lines that can't be executed. And from this information, we can, we can deduce 
coverage information, and we can deduce hot spots from our code. So, somebody ran with this and actually made a coverage tool. You should check it out. It works with Rails. I haven't made it work with my personal non-Rails projects yet, but supposedly it works with Rails. And you can read more about the coverage tool here. I have written an article that is in depth, and you, have, you can find it at this URL. Um, and actually, I, I actually have no more slides now. But I should mention, um, be careful with the stuff that I have presented, because the point about, the point about um, libyaml not being available on JRuby is actually an important point. I feel less important. And it is why I'm concerned about implementing libyaml, implementing Psych for JRuby. Um, but not all of this stuff is available for, say, Rubinius and other Ruby implementations. So please be careful. Um, though I think using the YAML parser is safer than, say, uh, oh, the object space stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.